we have the, the third lecture. Uh, our lecturer this time is Professor Dominique Turnes from France. He is currently uh, the Professor of Mathematics and History of Mathematics at the University of La Réunion. Um, he is going to lecture on Mathematics of Engineers, Elements for a New History of Numerical Analysis. Please welcome. Firstly, I, was, I want to thank the organizers of this History of Mathematics session. It's a great honor for me to be an invited speaker in this session. A few recent books have been devoted to the history of numerical analysis. Goldstein was a pioneer. His work focuses primarily on identifying numerical methods encountered in the works of some great mathematicians between Newton and Hermit. The main problems are the construction of logarithmic and trigonometric tables necessary to astronomical calculations, Kepler's equations, the lunar theory and its connection with the calculation of longitude, the free body problem, and more generally the study of perturbations of orbits of planets and comets. Through these problems, we assist to the birth of finite difference methods uh, for interpolating functions and calculating quadratures, development in series or continued fractions for solving algebraic equations and differential equations, and the method of least squares for finding optimal solutions of linear systems with more equations or less equations than unknown. At the end of the book, a few pages involve Rund, Rund, Ern, Kuta, Multon, that is to say, some characters who can be considered as being the first applied mathematicians identified as such in the late 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. Uh, these numerical methods were, uh, sorry, in Goldstein's survey, numerical analysis is thus the fruit of a few great mathematicians who developed the foundation of today's numerical analysis by solving some major problems of astronomy, celestial mechanics, and rational mechanics. In this story, a few areas of inspiration and intervention other than astronomy are sometimes mentioned incidentally, but no engineer is explicitly, explicitly quoted. While Goldstein actually begins his, in his, his story in the 16th century, Chabert gives more depth to the subject by examining numerical algorithms in a variety of texts from various civilizations since antiquity. Besides the previously mentioned problems of astronomy, there are some references to other domains, for example, the theory of vibrating streams of the signal theory. Some engineers are mentioned, in general in connection with secondary points. Only one of them, Cholesky, is quoted for a significant contribution consisting in an original method for solving linear systems. Despite these few openings compared to previous work, <coughs> most numerical analysis questions addressed in Schabert's book are presented as abstract mathematical problems out of context. In a more recent collective book edited by Bertil and Coos, the birth of modern numerical analysis is located precisely in 1947 in a paper of von Neumann and Goldstein which analyzes for the first time in detail the propagation of errors when solving a linear system in conjunction with the first uses of digital computers. The authors recognize naturally that a lot of numerical calculations were made long before this date in various questions of physics and engineering, but for them, the problem of the practical management of calculations made by computer actually founds the field of numerical analysis and this apparently technical problem is at the origin of the considerable theoretical developments that this domain generated since the mid 20th century. In this book, written not by historians but by specialists of numerical analysis, it's interesting to note that the accepted actors of the domain do not trace the history of their discipline beyond what characterizes their current personal practices. In fact, the birth of numerical analysis in the modern sense of the term 
should not be connected to the advent of digital computers, but to the distinction between pure mathematics and applied mathematics, formerly mixed mathematics, which is clarified gradually throughout the 19th century with a more and more marked separation between the two domains in scientific journals, institutions and university positions. The development of new calculating instruments has also contributed to set up a new equilibrium between analytical, numerical and graphical methods. This is actually around 1900 that mathematicians began to formulate what is meant by applied mathematics. Germany, and particularly Göttingen, play the leading role in this international process of institutionalization of applied mathematics as an autonomous domain. Encouraged by Felix Klein, Karl Hunger and Rudolf Menck assumed in 1901 the editor chief of the Zeitschrift for Mathematics and Physics and devoted this journal to applied mathematics. In 1904, Hung accepted the first full professorship of applied mathematics at the University of Göttingen. In 1907, German applied mathematicians adopted the following definition. The essence of applied mathematics lies in the development of methods that will lead to the numerical and graphical solution of mathematical problems. Recent research has shown that engineers have constituted a bridge between mathematics and their applications since the 18th century, and that problems encountered in ballistics, strength of materials, hydrodynamics, steam engines, electricity and telephone network played, played also an important role in the creation of original numerical and graphical methods of computation. In fact, the mathematical needs of engineers seem very different from those of mathematicians. To illustrate this with a significant example, consider the problem of the numerical solution of equations, a pervasive problem in all areas of mathematics intervention. When he became director of the École des Ponts et Chaussées in Paris, Léon Louis Lalanne, a French civil engineer, uh, said what you can see on the slide, Lalan says that as politely as possible, but his conclusion is clear. The method advocated by mathematicians are not satisfactory. These methods are complicated to understand, long to implement, and sometimes totally impracticable for ground engineers, foremen and technicians, who moreover did not always receive a high-level mathematical training. Given such, such a situation, 19th century engineers were often forced to imagine by themselves the operational methods and the calculation tools that mathematicians could not provide them. In this paper, I would want to show, through some examples from recent historical research, that the engineers, so little mentioned so far in the historiography of numerical analysis, have contributed significantly throughout the 19th century to the creation of those numerical and graphical methods that became an autonomous discipline around 1900. More than that, I shall underline that, that their practical methods have been sometimes at the origin of new theoretical problems that inspired also pure mathematicians. The 19th century is the moment of the first industrial revolution which spreads throughout the Western world at different rates in different countries. In this process, the engineering world acquires a new identity marked by its implications in the economic development of industrial states and the structuration of new <coughs> professional relationships that transcend national boundaries. Linked to the industrial revolution, enormous computational and mathematical requirements appear in all areas of engineering sciences. This led naturally to the question of engineering education. How were engineers prepared to use high-level mathematics in their daily work and, if necessary, to create by themselves new mathematical tools? The French model of engineering in the education in the early 19th century is that of the École Polytechnique founded in 1794. Although it had initially the ambition to be comprehensive and practice-oriented, this school promoted quickly a high-level teaching dominated by mathematical analysis. 
this theoretical teaching was then completed from the professional point of view by two years in application schools with civil and military purposes. Such a training model, which subordinates practice to theory, has produced a corporation of scholarly engineers, engineers savants in French, capable of using the theoretical resources acquired during their studies to achieve an unprecedented mathematization of the engineering art. This model is considered to have influenced the creation of many polytechnical institutes throughout Europe and to the United States. A paradigmatic example of a corpus of mathematical tools constituting an autonomous knowledge which was created from scratch by engineers themselves to meet their needs is that of nomography. The main purpose of nomography is to construct graphical tables for representing any relationship between three variables and more generally uh, relationships between any number of variables. Among the founding feathers of nomography, four were students at the École Polytechnique, Lalanne, Charles Dalman, Maurice Locagne and Rodolphe Soro. The only exception in this list is the Belgian engineer Julius Massot, an ancient student and then professor at the School of Civil Engineering of the University of Ghent, but in this school the training was comparable to that of the École Polytechnique with high-level courses of mathematics and mechanics. During the years 1830-1860, the sector of public works experiences a boom in France and more generally in Europe. The territories of the different countries are covered progressively by, a vast, by vast networks of roads, canals, and after 1842 of railways. These achievements require many tedious calculations of surfaces of cut and fill on cross sections of the ground. Cut and fill is the process of earth moving needed to construct a road, a canal or a railway. You have to cut land when the ground level is too high and then transport this land to fill the places where the ground level is too low. And to calculate roughly the volume of land to be transported, you have to decompose this volume in thin vertical slices, evaluate the area of each slice and sum all these elementary areas. Civil engineers try different methods of calculation more or less expeditious. Some, like Coriolis, have calculated numerical tables giving the surfaces directly based on a number of features of the road and its environment. Other engineers, especially in Germany and Switzerland, de design and build several kinds of planimeters, that is, mechanical instruments used to quickly calculate the area of any plane surface. These planimeters, which concretize the continuous summation of infinitesimal surfaces, had significant applications in many other scientific fields beyond capacity. <coughs> Still other engineers, like Lalanne, have imagined replacing numerical tables by graphical tables cheaper and easier to use. It is within this framework that nomography developed itself and was deepened throughout the second half of the 19th century. Lalanne, Massot, Lallemand and Docagne successively imagined new kinds of graphical tables to solve numerically the particular problem of cut and fill so important for economic reasons. The departure point of nomography lies in the fact that a relationship between three variables, alpha, beta and gamma, can be considered as the result of the elimination of two auxiliary variables, x and y, between three equations, each containing only one of the initial variables. One can then represent the equation by three sets of lines in the plane x, y, one of them parametrized by alpha, the second by beta, and the third by gamma. On this kind of graphical table, called the concurrent line ABAC, the solution of the equation corresponds to an intersection point of three lines. Uh, it was especially Lalanne in, in 1843 who gave a decisive impetus to the theory of these graphical tables, which he called ABAC. After Lalanne, the concurrent line ABAC spread rapidly until becoming, in the third quarter of the 19th century, very common calculation tools in the world of French engineers. 
Masso succeeded Ladan in enriching the method and its scope of application. For that, he introduced a notion of generalized anamorphosis, seeking what are the functions that can be represented using free pencils of straight lines. Masso put in evidence that the given relationship between three variables can be represented by a concurrent straight line abac if and only if it can be put into the form of a determinant in the type that you can see on the slide. This determinant, called the Masso determinants, played an important role in the subsequent history of nomography. They are encountered in research until today. In 1884, Dokan observes that the problem of the concurrency of three straight lines and the problem of the alignment of three points dual to each other are mathematically equivalent. Through a projective transformation, the concurrent straight line abac becomes a, an alignment nomogram following new terminology introduced by Dokan. After that, the science of graphical tables was called nomography. Alignment nomograms were quickly adopted by many engineers for the benefit of the most diverse applications. At the turn of the 20th century, nomography was already an autonomous discipline well established in the landscape of applied sciences. In general, the engineer is not supposed to develop a truly mathematical activity. We want to show, through the example of nomography, that this representation is somewhat erroneous. It is easy to realize that the engineer is sometimes a creator of new mathematics and in addition that some of the problems which he arises can in turn irrigate the theoretical research of mathematicians. Firstly, the problem of general anamorphosis, that is to say of characterizing the relationships between three variables that can be put in the form of a mass determinant has inspired many theoretical re uh, research. Some mathematicians and engineers have brought partial responses to this problem before that in 1912, the Swedish Thomas Akon Trondval gives a complete solution resulting in the existence of a common integral to two very complicated partial differential equations. But as one can easily imagine, this solution was totally inefficient except in very simple cases. After Gronwald, other mathematicians considered the problem of anamorphosis in a different way, with a more algebraic approach that led to study the important theoretical problem of linear independence of functions of several variables. A complete and satisfactory solution was finally found by the Polish mathematician Mieczysław Gronius in his dissertation of 19. Uh, 58, Wormus defined precisely what is a nomographic function, that is a function of two variables that can be represented by an alignment <coughs> nomogram, and classified nomographic functions through homography into 17 equivalent classes of mass flow determinants. Beyond the central problem of nomographic representation of relationships between three variables, which define implicit functions of two variables, there is a more general problem of the representation of functions of three or more variables. Engineers have explored various ways in this direction, the first consisting in decomposing a function of any number of variables into a finite sequence of functions of two variables, which results in the combined use of several nomograms with three variables, each connected to the next by means of a common variable. Such a practical concern was equaled unexpectedly in the formulation of the Hilbert 13th problem, one of the famous uh, 23 problems that were presented at the International Congress of Mathematicians in 1900. It is entitled in possibility of the solution of the general equation of the seventh degree by means of functions of only arguments. Hilbert says, now, it is probable that the root of the equation of the seventh degree is a function of its coefficients, which does not belong to this class of functions capable of nomographic construction. That is to say, that it cannot be constructed by a finite number of insertions of functions of two arguments. <coughs> In 1901, Docagne 
had found a way to represent the equation of the seventh degree by a nomogram involving an alignment of three points, two being carried by simple scales and the third by a double scale. Hilbert rejected this solution because it involved a mobile element. Without going into details, we will retain that there has been an interesting dialogue between an engineer and a mathematician, reasoning in two different perspectives. In the terms formulated by Hilbert, it was only in 1957 that the 13th problem is solved negatively by Vladimir Arnold, who proved to everyone's surprise that every continuous function of three variables could be decomposed into a continuous function of two variables only. In another domain, that of topography, the French military engineer André Louis Cholesky offers us the occasion of a perfect case study. Cholesky was admitted uh, to the École Polytechnique in 1895, and two years later he became a sous-lieutenant at the École d'Application de l'Artillerie et du Génie in Fontainebleau. In this school, he had courses on artillery, fortification, construction, mechanics, and topography. In 1905, he was assigned to the geographical service of the staff of the army. Among other tasks, he participated in the establishment of the map of Algeria and a precise geometric leveling of this country. The problem of the adjustment of networks of triangles concerned many officers of the geographical service eager to find a simple, fast and accurate method. It was at the occasion that Cholesky imagined his method for solving the equation of conditions by the method of his squares. Cholesky is representative of these scholarly engineers of whom we spoke before. Due to his high-level mathematical training, he was able to work with efficiency and creativity in three domains as a military engineer specialized in artillery and topography, able to improve and optimize the method used on the ground at this time, as a mathematician able to create new algorithms when it is necessary, and as a teacher. Concerning his mathematical activity, Cholesky method for linear systems is actually an important step in the history of numerical analysis. A system of linear equations has infinitely many solutions when the number of unknowns is greater than the number of equations. Among all possible solutions, one looks for the solution minimizing the sum of the squares of the unknowns. This is the case in the adjustment of triangles in topography, the problem in which Cholesky was interested. As it is known, the least square method leads to a system with a symmetric positive definite matrix. Uh, I don't want to, to go into details uh, for now, but the key of the method is to decompose the matrix A into a matrix, into the product of a matrix L, uh, a lower tri triangular, triangular matrix with positive diagonal elements and the transposed matrix. And the fact is that the positive diagonal elements can be computed by an explicit algorithm. What was the situation before Cholesky? When the matrix A is symmetric, Gauss method makes no use of this property and needs too many arithmetical operations. In 1907, Otto Taplitz showed that an Hermitian matrix can be factorized into a product L, L uh, adjoint with L lower triangular, but he gave no rule for obtaining the matrix A. That is precisely what Cholesky did in 1910. Cholesky method was presented for the first time in 1924 in a note published in the Bulletin Geodésique by Commandant Benoit, a French geodesist who knew Cholesky well, but the method remained unknown outside the circle of French military topographers. Cholesky method was rebirthed by John Toll who taught it in his numerical analysis course at King's College in London in 1946, and thus made it known. When Claude Bresensky classified Cholesky's papers in uh, uh, 2003, he discovered the original unpublished manuscript where Cholesky explained his methods. 
The manuscript of eight pages is dated 2 December 1910, but was an important discovery for the history of numerical analysis. The main problem of exterior ballistics is to determine the trajectory of a projectile launched from a cannon with a given angle and a given velocity. The differential equation of motion involves the gravity G, the velocity V, and the tangent inclination theta of the projectile, and the air resistance F of V, which is an unknown function of V. This problem of determining the ballistic trajectory for a given law of air resistance is particularly interesting because it stands at the crossroads of two partly contradictory concerns. On the one hand, the integration of the differential equation of motion is a difficult problem which interests the mathematicians from the point of view of pure analysis. On the other hand, the artillery men on the battlefield must determine quickly the firing angle and the initial velocity of their projectile in order to attain a given target and for that practical purpose they need firing tables precise and easy to use. <coughs> Euler is truly at the starting point of the concrete calculation of firing tables in the case of the square of the velocity. In 1753, he resumes Bernoulli's solution and puts it in a form that will be convenient for numerical computation. He takes the slope of the tangent as principal variable. All the other quantities are expressed in function of this slope by means of quadratures. The integration is then done by successive arcs. Each small arc of the curve is replaced by a small straight line whose inclination is the mean of the inclinations at the extremities of the arc. To give an example, Euler calculates a single table and constructs by points the corresponding trajectory. Extensive ballistic tables were then computed uh, following Euler's method, first by Gravenitz in, in Rostock in 1764, and then by Otto in uh, 1834. Otto's tables will experience a great success and will be in use until the early 20th century, and, and they were translated in many other languages. Many other attempts were done to calculate concretely the firing tables. Some engineers developed in series the solutions of the ballistic equation and kept the first terms for their concrete calculations. Others tried to slightly modify the, the coefficients of the differential equation for it to become integrable in finite terms. Let us, let us mention finally graphical approaches providing to the artillery men an easy and economic tool. In 1767, Lambert constructs a set of curves from Gravenitz ballistic tables. In France, uh, an original approach is due to Alexander Magnus Dobenheim, a military engineer. His idea was to replace the numerical tables by a set of curves carefully constructed by points calculated with great precision. These curves were drawn on a portable instrument called the gunner board, planchette du canonnier in French. The quadrature method used to construct these curves is highly developed. Obenheim employs a method of New Newton coach type with a division of each interval into 24 parts. In 1848, Isidore Didion, another military engineer, constructs ballistic curves that are not a simple graphic representation of numerical tables, but are obtained directly from the differential equation by a true <coughs> graphical calculation. He obtains a curve by successive arcs of circles using at each step the geometric construction of the center of curvature. One of the major advantages of these graphical tables is their simplicity and rapidity of utilization which is very important on the battlefield when the enemy is firing against you. In parallel with these numerical and graphical explorations, 
the theoretical mathematical research was going on. After Bernoulli, other cases of integrability were discovered by D'Alembert in 1744 and partially rediscovered independently by Legendre and Jacobi. Jacobi put the equations in a form suitable for the use of elliptic integrals. Several ballisticians found here inspiration to calculate ballistic tables in the case of air resistance proportional to the Q or the fourth power of velocity. This attempt contributed to popularize elliptic functions among engineers and were quoted in a lot of treatises about elliptic functions. During the 19th century, one can note another parallelism between the increasing speeds of bullets and cannonballs and the appearance of new instruments to measure these speeds. Ballisticians were then conducted to propose new air resistance laws for certain intervals of speeds. In ballistic treatises, we can find an impressive list of empirical laws of air resistance that were used to calculate tables at the end of the 19th century. Thus, theoretical developments, initially free in D'Alembert's hands, led to tables that were actually used by an artillery man. The fact that some functions determined by artillery men from experimental measurements fell within the scope of integrable forms has reinforced the idea that it might be useful to continue the search for such forms. It is within this context then, that Francesco Sayacci, an Ital Italian military engineer, resumed the theoretical search for integrable forms of the law of resistance. In two papers published in 1901, he places himself explicitly in D'Alembert's tradition. He multiplies the differential equation by various multipliers and six conditions for these multipliers are integrant factors. He discovers several integrable equations, including one new integrable Riccati equation. This study led, leads to eight families of air resistance laws, some of which depend on four parameters. In the second article, he adds two more families to his list. The question of integrability by quadratures of the ballistic equation is finally resolved in 1920 by Jules Drac, a brilliant mathematician who has contributed much in Galois theory of differential equations in the tradition of Picard, Lee, and Dessieux. Drac puts the ballistic equation in a new form that allows him to apply a theory developed in 1914 for a certain class of differential equations, which he found all cases of reduction. Back exhausts therefore the problem from the theoretical point of view by finding again all integrability cases previously identified. As you might expect, the results of this long memoir of 94 pages are very complicated. They were greeted without enthusiasm by the ballisticians who did not see at all how to transform them into practical applications. In conclusion for this part, throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, there has been an interesting interaction between analytical theory of differential equations, numerical and graphical integration, and empirical experimental research. Mathematical research on the ballistic equation has nevertheless played the role of a laboratory where the modern numerical analysis was able to develop. Engineers have indeed been able to test on this recalcitrant equation all possible approaches to calculate the solution of the differential equation. There is no doubt that these tests, joined with the similar ones conceived by astronomers for the differential equations of celestial mechanics, have helped to organize the domain into a separate discipline around 1900. In parallel with celestial mechanics, ballistics certainly played an important role on the, in the construction of modern Runge Kuta and Adams Bashforth methods for numerically integrating ordinary differential equations. Concerning another part of the theory of differential equations, it should be noticed that the classification of singular poles obtained by Poincaré in his famous 
mémoire sur les courbes définies par une équation différentielle, had occurred earlier in the works of at least two engineers who dealt with hydraulic problems. As early as uh, 1924, Russian historians reported a similar classification in a memoir of Zhukovsky dated 1876 on the kinematics of liquids. In what Zhukovsky called critical points, we recognize the so-called saddles, nodes, focuses and centers. The second engine is the Belgian Junius Masso, already encountered before the monography. Consider that the creator of graphical integration, he developed elaborate techniques to construct precisely the integral curves of differential equations. Uh, he published a large memoir on graphical integration. <coughs> book 6, the last book of the memoir, is devoted to applications in hy hydraulics. Masso examines, examines the motion of liquids in pipes and canals. Among these specialized, de specialized developments, a general and theoretical statement on graphic integration of first-order differential equations appears. The entire study of a differential equation rests on the preliminary construction of the uh, Loki of points where integral curves have the same slope. Masso calls such a locus the misocline. Masso explained that you can easily obtain by properly com combining the directions associated to successive isoclines, graphical constructions equivalent to the Newton code quadrature formulas. Whereas, the same problem would be difficult to solve numerically because of the implicit equations that appear at each step of the calculation. In fact, numerical algorithms of order greater than 2 will be discovered only at the turn of the 20th century by the German applied mathematician Rung, Owen and Kuta. The construction of the integral curves from isoclines is another way of studying globally the differential equation. In contrast to Poincaré's abstract approach, Masso's diagram both gives a global description and a local description of the curves. This diagram is both an instrument of numerical calculation with sufficient accuracy for the poor engineer's needs and a heuristic tool for discovering properties of the differential equation. For example, <coughs> Masso applies this technique to hydraulics in studying the permanent motion of water flowing in a canal. The differential equation to be solved is very complicated. With his elaborate graphical technique, Masso constructs isoclines and studies the behavior of the integral curves. He discovers that there is what he calls the asymptotic point, the integral curves approaching this point are turning indefinitely around it. Masso then develops a theoretical study of singular points from isoclines. By geometric reasoning, Masso finds the same results as Poincaré concerning the singular points, but in a very different manner. He starts with the case where isoclines are convergent straight lines. In the general case, when isoclines pass by the same point, Masso studies the integral curves around this point by replacing the isocline by their tangents. A singular point is always called a focus. The special case, what we call focus today, is the only one to receive a particular name, that of asymptotic point. Masso determines very carefully the various possible positions around the focus by considering the number of straight line solutions passing through this point. In Masso's reasoning, isoclines play the same role as Poincaré's arcs without contact to, to guide the path of integral curves. By using the graphical technique developed at first as a simple technique of numerical calculation, Masso succeeds also in a qualitative study, the purpose of which is the global layout of the integral curves and the description of their properties. Clearly, Masso and Zukowski are part of a geometric tradition that survived since the beginning of calculus within engineering and applied mathematics circles. 
in this tradition, one kept on constructing equations with graphical computation and mechanical devices, whereas theoretical mathematicians came to prefer the analytical approach. It should be noticed also that Poincaré was at first an engineer for the École des Mines. His training and practice in engineering played certainly a significant role in his personal conception and approach of differential equations, very different from the one on some other academic mathematicians of his time. Following Masso's ideas, the Dutch physicist Balthazar van der Poel used the technique of his outlines to graphically integrate the famous equation he found to describe the electrical oscillations of a triode. His calculations have constituted a new important step in the constitution of the theory of dynamical systems. I have thus presented some examples, mainly during the second half of the 19th century and the early 20th, that illustrate how civil and military engineers have been strongly engaged in the mathematical activity of that time. The examples that I have chosen are directly related to my own research, but I could mention some other recent works going in the same direction. David Aubin and Alain Glukov have studied the scientific and social context of ballistics during and around the First World War, the one in France and the other in the United States. These papers prolong what I have presented before and put in evidence similar collaborations and tensions between two major milieux, the one of artillery men and the other one of mathematicians. The new firing situations encountered during the First World War generated new theoretical problems impossible to solve analytically and thus favored the creation of new numerical algorithms such as Adams Moulton methods for ordinary differential equations. Costas Chadzis has studied the professional milieu of the uh, 19th century French engineers from the sociological and economic point of view. In particular, he has reviewed the conditions of diffusion of graphical sta statics in Europe. Graphical statics was an extensively used calculation tool for example, for the construction of metallic bridges and buildings, such as the famous Eiffel Tower in Paris. Its development is closely linked to that of, of descriptive geometry and projectile geometry. For her part, Marie-Josée Durand-Richard has examined the mathematical machines designed by engineers between Babbage machine and the first digital computer. These machines, which include planimeters, antigraphs, and differential analyzers, have played a major role in solving differential equations encountered in many areas. The technical and industrial design of these machines has contributed to the development of new numerical and graphical methods, but also to some advances in logic and information theory, as seen in the work of Shannon. During and after the Second World War, all this knowledge has been transferred to the first computers like Pignac. More generally, Renate Tobi has explored the relationships between mathematics, science, industry, politics and society, taking as support of her work the paradigmatic case of Iris Runge, a Karl Runge's daughter, who was a mathematician working for Osram and Telefunken corporations. In the early 20th century, the emerging application of electricity became a new field of research for engineers, who were then faced with non-linear differential equations with complex behavior. Jean-Marc Ginou, Christophe Letellier, and Loïc Petit-Girard have studied the history of oscillatory phenomena produced by various electrical devices. As we have seen before, Van der Poel is one of the major figures in this field. A little more, more later, Alexander Andronov established a correspondence between the solution of the differential system given by Van der Poel to characterize the oscillations of the triode and the concept of limit cycle created by Poincaré, thus connecting the investigations of engineers to those of mathematicians. 
Loïc Petit-Girard is also interested in another engineer mathematician struggling with non-linear differential equations. Nikola Minorsky, an engineer from the Russian Navy, trained at the Naval Academy in St. Petersburg. Minorsky was a specialist in the design, stabilization and control of ships. In his naval research during the year 1920-1930, he was confronted with theoretical problems related to non-linear differential equations and established mathematical results adapted to maritime issues. He also conceived a system of analog computing in connection with the theory of nonlinear oscillations and the stability theory, emphasizing that the theories produced by mathematicians like Poincaré remain incomplete without computational tools to implement them. All these recent works demonstrate a large entanglement between the milieu of civil engineers, military engineers, physicists, astronomers, applied mathematicians and pure mathematicians. Of course, these categories are, were far from watertight. It seems necessary to take all them into account if we want to rethink the construction of knowledge in the domain of numerical analysis and if we want to avoid the historical bias of the projection into the past of contemporary conceptions of the discipline. A new history remains to be written which would not focus only on a few major authors and some high-level mathematical algorithms but also on the actors of the domain in the broad sense of the term and on the numerical and graphical methods actually performed by users on the ground or at the office. A good start to this problem could be, among others, to identify, classify and analyze the mathematical texts contained in the many engineering journals published in Europe and elsewhere since the early 19th century. This could allow to characterize more precisely the mathematical knowledge created and used by engineers and to study the circulation of this knowledge between the professional circles of engineers and other groups of actors involved in the development of mathematical <coughs> ideas and practice. Thank you. Please. Any questions? Okay. Thank you very much.